what causes earthquakes? What dangers would you face if an earthquake happened in your area? How do we study and prepare for earthquakes? Now, depending on where you live, you may experience earthquakes on a regular basis, or you might never have felt one at all. Earthquakes are very common in California, but where I grew up on the East Coast, not so much. And scientists, seismologists, cannot predict when or where earthquakes will happen. But the more technology advances, the more warning we can give. And who knows, maybe a method for accurate prediction will come too. The key to detecting earthquakes early so that you can give people a warning that danger is coming is having a warning system in place. Now, I realize that sounds simplistic. You need a warning system to get accurate warnings about earthquakes. Countries like Japan, Turkey, and Mexico already have earthquake warning systems, but the U.S. does not yet have one in place. Now, there are plans and projects being tested, and maybe by the time you watch this video, they will be implemented. Approximately 143 million Americans live in areas that are prone to seismic or earthquake activity. Warning systems work using seismometers. A seismometer is an instrument that detects earthquake waves. And we will be doing an activity in the next lesson to demonstrate how these seismometers work. If you live in an area that is prone to earthquakes, you might also want to look into getting an accelerometer, a sensor that works with your computer to help track and report earthquakes. Ideally, seismometers would be connected to a computer network so that the speed and location of the earthquakes could quickly and easily be detected and people who live in the affected area could be, giving a warning, could be given a warning. With earthquakes, even a few seconds of warning to get under a table or out of a building can make a huge difference. So, the technical definition of an earthquake is a series of low-frequency seismic, or earth waves, somewhat like sound waves. Earthquakes originate from tectonic processes such as fault movements and volcanoes. Now, the not-so-technical definition. Earthquakes are when the earth shakes. <gasps> Whoa, right. Okay, I've used words like seismologist, seismograph, and seismic a couple of times already. So to be clear and make sure you understand, seismo means earthquake. So seismic means dealing with earthquakes. A seismologist is a scientist who studies earthquakes. And a seismometer is an instrument that measures earthquakes. Most earthquakes are caused by tectonic plates moving against each other. The friction that comes from them rubbing against each other, you know, I can like grab my mug and drag it over the table. You hear a noise that comes from the friction between the table and the mug. Now, if you were here, or you could try it there where you are, you could also lay your head down and feel a small vibration in the table as a result of the mug's movement. Now, earthquakes are the same idea, just on a much larger scale. Most of the time, my mug, I mean seismic plates, are still, and they don't move or cause any problems. But then every once in a while, they move, and the resulting, and the resulting is shaking or quaking, to have, and they have the potential to be disastrous. Earthquake waves travel through the crust, but they can also travel down through the Earth's interior. Because of the way they travel, earthquakes have the potential to affect large areas of the Earth's surface. Earthquakes are not only caused by plate tectonics, though. They can also be caused by volcanoes or can come from landslides. Now, we're going to focus on the ones that are caused by tectonic forces. And thankfully, the vast majority of earthquakes are very small. They happen every day and aren't strong enough for people to feel. You could go online and search earthquakes today, and there are websites that tell you what has happened recently. In Chapter 2, we defined a force as a push or a pull. Usually we think of pushes or pulls happening between two different objects. This is the part of the lesson where normally I would like grab a student and have them come and stand beside me, and then I would start pushing and pulling them back and forth. You get the idea. But those forces are coming from the outside. I'm putting a force on that student from outside his own body or her own body. Now sometimes forces build inside an object. So stress is a force exerted inside a material. Now, there are three types of stress, compression, tension, and shear. Let me explain. So a compression is when an object is squeezed or crushed. Tension pulls objects apart. And shear forces pull in opposite directions. This picture from your book helps to illustrate. The fork is pushing the gelatin in one direction, and then the plate is exerting a force in the opposite direction. 
there are different types of boundaries between tectonic plates and different types of fault lines along the edges of those plates. So there are different forces based on how rocks are interacting with each other. Now in the last chapter, we learned that divergent boundaries are when tectonic plates are moving away from each other. So what, time of, what type of force do you think is common in a divergent boundary? Yeah, that would be a tension force. Tension forces are in divergent boundary areas. Then there are also convergent plate boundaries, and these would have compression forces, where one is pushing down on the other. And then along transform boundaries, because these are where plates move in opposite directions, this is where shear forces are common. Now, shear forces are the most important forces in areas of seismic activity. So why would shear forces be most important, you ask? Well, it's because shear forces are what most commonly cause earthquakes because of the way they move against each other. So, since shear earthquakes affect people most in terms of earthquakes, they are considered the most important. Have you ever strained a muscle or fractured a bone? What actually happens when you strain a muscle? Well, a strain is damage to muscle. Maybe you pulled or tore a muscle. A fracture is a break in the bone. We tend to think of rocks as very rigid, but under the right circumstances, rocks can stretch, bend, or be compressed. Now, there's a couple more terms I need to insert here. First, we have a joint. A joint is a stress crack in a rock that shows no indications of motion. That's the key. No indications of motion of the rock on either side of the crack. And then a fault is a crack in the rock where both sides have moved. And we'll talk more about those terms in the next lesson. Now, back to the idea that rocks can bend, stretch, or compress under the right circumstances. Now, this picture shows an example of a metal that was stretched out. And not all metals and rocks bend the same way. Ductility refers, refers to the amount of strain a substance can endure without breaking. A material that's very brittle cannot withstand much stress or strain, but breaks fairly easily. But materials that are more elastic can bend a lot before they break. Now, glass would be a good example of a brittle material. Rubber is very elastic. So all that to say that not all rocks respond the same way to a stress. The more elasticity a rock has, the more energy gets stored up in the rock. So when it does actually break, a lot of energy is released and you can get a very violent earthquake. Let me explain it another way. If you have a little cup and you spill the water out of it, it'll make a mess, but not too bad. However, if you have a huge pitcher of water and accidentally dump that thing out, it will make a huge mess. The more water, in the con the more water a container holds, the bigger the mess when it's spilled, okay? It's the same idea with rocks. Brittle rocks don't hold much strain, so they might break, but it's just a little break, a weak break, and when stronger rocks finally break, that break, that quake, is much stronger because the rock was holding more force. The more force a rock can hold, the more potential energy that can be rela released. Now to close our lesson today, I want to go over this insert from page 126 in your textbook. We've talked a couple of times about the theistic evolution idea of analogous days. Remember that theistic evolution theories are attempts to bring together creation and evolution. The analogous days theory teaches that the creation account in Genesis is symbolic, that the days of creation teach about each type of thing God created, but that the days of creation were long periods of time and that those days overlapped as things evolved. So the key idea is that the analogous day teaches Genesis 1 is symbolic. So what are some problems with this theories? Well, we keep coming back to the phrase, the evening and the morning. It's used repeatedly to indicate a literal 24-hour time period. Exodus 20 restates that God created the earth in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. Also, even, there, even though there is symbolism in Scripture, that symbolism is presented as symbolism, like with parables. And then historical accounts are presented as historical accounts. And Genesis is presented as historical. If you try to say that it's just symbolic, it opens the door for reinterpreting other areas of Scripture as well. Scripture presents Genesis as literal, real. It's a real account of how our world got here. What we see in the world backs up scripture. 
we don't need to try to rationalize or justify what we believe in any way. The Bible is enough.